But hey, who's ready to get into the Word of God this morning? Amen. You did? You got, Leif is ready. And I, I can't miss you, Leif, with your jumper. It's like you've got the prophecy jumper on today. You, you want someone to pray for you, Leif, and notice you? Or just, it's just warm? We can do that, Leif. We can definitely do that. But hey, I want to share this morning, if you get the church text, uh, you would have known yesterday the topic of what we're doing today. If you don't get the church text, please tell us so that we can add you to the church text so that you know what's happening. We'll never sell your information or give it to anybody else, apart from the fact I wouldn't know how to do that. Uh, We just want to do it to encourage you and keep you up to date with what's happening here. But I want to share today a biblical perspective or talk through biblically about anxiety. And some of you might be like, oh, what's happening? Anxiety, that's not usually something you would hear about at church, so we're not really at a a mental health seminar, which interestingly, I am a qualified mental health first aid instructor, so I do have a bit of knowledge when it comes to the teaching behind this, but I wanna talk today from a biblical perspective. What does the Bible say about anxiety? You know, anxiety is a serious condition. It's a serious condition that makes it extremely difficult for people to cope with daily life. If you've ever experienced anxiety, you wouldn't wish it on anyone. It's not a nice thing to go through. And studies show, or statistics say, that three million Australians are currently, that's today, living with anxiety. Three million Australians. And research shows that one in four Australians will experience anxiety sometime in their life. That's a quarter of the population. That's a lot. Anxiety is the most common mental health condition in Australia. Most common in Australia. And so based on that, I think it's appropriate to tackle this topic at church. Would you agree? To see what does the Bible say about that? Surely if this is a big issue affecting the world, the Bible would have something to say on that. So we're going to have a look through the Word of God this morning. Uh, I personally had some terrible bouts of anxiety between 10 and 15 years ago, and I wouldn't wish it on anyone. One of our kids this year, in term, sort of the end of term one and beginning of term two, had a terrible bout of anxiety, and I mean terrible. Anyone would know, Gay actually asked me about it this morning before church, and that's a whole other story about what we did to help him through that, And from a practical point of view, there are very practical things that you can do. But from a biblical point of view, it's good to understand what the Bible says about these things. Some of the anxiety disorders that you would have heard of would maybe be panic disorder. People who have panic attacks, their body just, it's almost like it's shutting down and they can't do anything, they're having a panic attack. That's anxiety. There's generalized anxiety disorder. Specific phobias, people who can't leave the house for different reasons. Maybe there's a problem with, it could be snakes or spiders, specific things that you're quite afraid of or anxious about. Also, obsessive compulsive disorder is an anxious disorder. So these are a lot of the things that Australians are battling at the moment. But I love to study the Word of God and see what God says about these things. And it's interesting, it's 2024. We have advanced a long way. We have car alarms, we have house alarms, we have smoke detectors in our house, we have EMF thing, we have all these things, bank notifications, so many different man-made inventions that you would think would make our life less anxious. But they don't. The days that we are living in, people seem to be getting more and more anxious. Yet with all of these things that man has invented to make us less anxious, Unfortunately, it seems we have more, not less, to worry about. And you know, I could go on and on and on about all the list of things that have been created to help us feel less anxious. You know, we, our cars give us collision warnings, our phones give us weather warnings. I was talking to a lady the other day, and I, it was quite surprising, I didn't know you could do this. We were just standing there talking, and her phone was in her pocket, and it just said, rain expected, 10 minutes. And I said, what was that? She goes, oh, it's the Willy Weather app. It just tells you stuff. Anyway, I looked at the sky and said, well, you've got to be kidding, don't you? But about 20 minutes later, it poured with rain in Donald. And I thought, her phone told her that. And I don't know about you, but when you're hanging out washing in the morning, wouldn't you like your phone to say, don't hang washing today? <laughs> I mean, I would. Because sometimes you hang it out and think, what was the point of that? But there's so much to be anxious about, so many things that have been made that we shouldn't 
be anxious. And no matter how much we attempt to control our own lives, we do have to admit we cannot control everything. And therein lies the problem with anxiety. Unfortunately, we want to design our own life. We, we want to have control over things. But in a world full of variables that you cannot control, we have to learn how is it that the Bible says be anxious for nothing? If we can't control the weather, then how can we not be anxious for nothing? We can't control the stock market. We can't control supermarket prices. We can't control how our spouse behaves. We can't control how our kids behave. So how do we be anxious for nothing? That's what the Bible says. How can we fight against the wave of anxiety in Australia? The Bible says be anxious for nothing. And we're like, but God, have you been here? Have you walked in 2024? There's a lot happening. So let's have a look at the words, the, the verses in the Bible today. The overarching issue that we're going to look at today is where the scripture says, be anxious for nothing. Wouldn't it be nice if that was how we actually approached every day? To be anxious for nothing. To actually really apply the word of God and say, okay, Jesus, I know that you've got this. And we're going to look at four different things today from the scriptures to help us face anxiety. But let's pray first. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the creator and that you made us in your image. We thank you that we have the toolbox. We thank you that we have the Bible, which is full of wisdom for us. And yet, even in these days that we live in, 2024, where you would think all these man-made inventions and creations would help us, Unfortunately, we seem to be more worried and more anxious than ever before. God, we pray as we open your scriptures today, by your Holy Spirit, you would speak to us. God, that you would open our eyes this morning, open our ears this morning. Let us have a teachable heart today to hear your word. We give you thanks this morning. We give you all the praise. And everyone who's ready for the word said? Amen. Amen. So we're going to look at four ways today. Can someone say four? Four. That's how old Samuel is now. Just get him to teach him what a four is. Four ways that you and I must fight anxiety in our lives. Four ways. The first one is this one. If you're taking notes, point one, to fight anxiety, we must learn to embrace contentment. Can you say that this morning? Embrace contentment. You know, we live in a world where the sin of coveting is every marketer's dream. Your next door neighbor buys a new massive LED TV. What do you want? An even bigger, newer, more massive LED TV. Your next door neighbor's got a barbecue and you can smell it and you think, I want a better barbecue than mine. There's actually an episode of Bluey about this. I don't know if you've ever seen this. Bluey's got some really great parenting and biblical wisdom in there. But the next door neighbor buys a barbecue. And of course, what does Bandit want? A better barbecue. So he goes down to what we know is Bunnings, but it's Hammer Barn in the store. And you see how he goes on this journey of basically coveting what his neighbor has. And so we look around. People around us get new cars. We think, well, I want a better car. Now, I'm not saying that was you, Russ and Sharon. Like, I know that you wanted a better car than us. It's all right. Ours has, we have a button to open our boot, Russ. You don't have that. So I'm just saying, you know, you compare apples and apples here. But people think you get a new car, then others should get a new car too. Or you look around and someone else get a pay rise in your workplace and you think, well, I should get a pay rise too. So coveting things and learning to embrace contentment is one of the things covered in the scriptures. Who, who remembers what the last of the Ten Commandments is? If you don't remember, I can tell you, but it sounds like Andrea does. Exodus 20 verse 17 says this, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. That's a good one. Or his servants, or his ox, or his donkey, which is probably like his car or his tractor, or anything else that is your neighbor's. Do not covet. That's the Old Testament. Let's have a look in the New Testament. Luke 12 verse 15 says, And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. Covetousness. Wow, that's 
How do you say that? Covetousness. Covetousness. You know what I mean, coveting, basically. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So both the Old and the New Testament talk about this, but Luke says, take care and be on guard, which means these things can come out of nowhere. They can really take you by surprise. And before you know it, you think, well, why am I coveting what everybody else has? Should I not be grateful and thankful for what I have? Jesus goes straight for the heart here. He hits on covetousness, in other words, by addressing discontentment. So if you are discontent with something, then you fall into the trap of coveting what others have. Jesus says to us that one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Yet in this very material world we live in, a lot of people measure success in that way. How big is your house? What kind of car do you drive? What kind of clothes do you wear? What school do your kids go to? It's, it's like we've actually become label losers. People want to have the labels. They want to have all the things. And I'm not saying that those things are bad innately in and of themselves, but it's the desire to chase those things. That's where the sin lies. We are not to covet. The word translated covet in Luke 12, 15 can also mean greed. And Jesus says to take care or beware of greed. It's like a warning that he gives us in 1 Timothy 6, verse 10, for he says, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. He didn't say money is evil. He said the love of money is evil. So it's the same thing as your car is not evil. But if you love that car and you just want to, you're so obsessed with that car and everybody wants to see your car and you need everyone to know what kind of car you drive, that is where the sin is. Your car is not a sin. It's the love you have for your possessions. And this is where we can get a little bit off track. Timothy says, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Beware of the love of money. Beware of the love of things. If you want to fight against anxiety, the first step is to embrace contentment. Embrace what you have and be thankful for what you have. Thanking Jesus for what he has provided. Why don't you ask yourself this morning, do I always want more? Am I always wanting more? You know, we've got friends, very financially successful. They own a couple of law firms. They own a farm. They've got businesses left, right, and center. Very successful couple. Huge givers in the kingdom of God. Huge givers. And they have a podcast. And he covered this topic. How much money is too much money? Because people would say to him, bro, like, do you want to calm down on the money side of things? You think you've got enough? But he would say... The more I earn, the more I can give into the kingdom of God. He has a gift to create wealth, not to hold it, but to use it in the kingdom of God. And so he says, how much money is too much money is only a question you can ask yourself. And I was talking to a friend about this the other day, and she wants to be very successful in her business, and I really believe that she will be because her heart's desire is, Lord, don't line my pockets so that I can drive a Lamborghini, but line my pockets so the next time I see a missionary or the next time I hear about a not-for-profit or the next time I hear about someone that is doing something for the kingdom of God, I will automatically have what they need to meet the need. Not because they want to be in Europe for six months of the year, but because they see the financial needs out there and they want God to use her. They want she, so she's praying, God, would you bless my business so I can give it to those people around me? It's a completely different attitude to, God, I just want to store up all this wealth. I just want to have bank accounts full of money. What is the point of that? You can't take that anywhere. When you die, it's just you in that timber box. There's no bank accounts, there's no bank cards. And there is wisdom in using finances properly, setting up your children, leaving a legacy. All of that is a sermon for another day. But we're talking about this morning is anxiety and being content and saying, God, I'm thankful 
for what you've given me. I'm thankful, Jesus, for what you've given him. So I would encourage you today to search your heart and say, God, do I have an attitude that's always wanting more? Am I always wanting something newer, better, greater, bigger, whatever it is? And ask God to deal with your heart in only a way that he can. The next point this morning, if we're going to fight anxiety, the second thing is to fight anxiety through concern. It sounds a bit interesting, I know, but this isn't just any type of concern because concern alone could actually morph into anxiety. If you become so concerned about something that you're almost fixated on it, then that could turn into an anxiety in and of itself. We don't need to be focused on the wrong things. If you are concerned about worldly things and yourself, you will only become more anxious. You will only become more anxious because the desire in you to want more and more and more will never be met. Now, have you ever spoken to rich people? And there's two different ones, or well, there's probably more than two, but I love talking to the ones like my friend who I mentioned with the law firms. They are so content. They love their life. Yes, they drive a pretty nice car. Yes, they live in a pretty nice house. But the amount of money that goes through their bank accounts to other people is phenomenal. And they don't do that to brag. They do that because their ministry is to teach people in business how to create wealth, to be a conduit so it goes back out again for God and his kingdom. If we are concerned about worldly things, we become more anxious. The concern that we have must be for the Lord and matters of the kingdom. That's where we need to be focusing. This brings us back to the first and second greatest commandments that we find in Matthew 22, 37 to 39. And it says this, he says to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So if you do that, you don't have anything else left to love. You're loving God with everything. You're focusing on him. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is just like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. With this in mind, let's jump into the parable about a rich young man, we know the story about this guy, who did not obey those commandments. This story is in Luke 12, 16 to 17, and it says this. He told him a parable saying, the land of a rich young man produced plentifully. All the farmers here this morning say, amen, I want my farm to produce plentifully. And he said to himself, well, for what shall I do? I have nowhere to store my crops. It is important to note that this man was already rich before this abundant harvest. He already had lots of cash. <coughs> he was already rich before his abundant crop. He had many goods, and as we'll see in a moment, the land he produced was producing amazing crops. But I love how Jesus tells this parable. The rich man had quite a dialogue with himself. He starts off in verse 17 asking himself a question, and frankly, that's a pretty good question. What will I do with the harvest? What will I do with all of this? That's probably a good thing, a good question to say to God, well, what will I do with this? I don't believe he was talking to God. I believe he was thinking to himself, what will I do with this? What will I do with my bountiful harvest? That is a wise and practical question. He couldn't leave it there and let it spoil because that wouldn't be wise. He needed to make a decision. And sadly, that is where all wisdom stopped for him. Let's keep looking forward. In verse 18, it says, And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my old barns, and I'm going to build newer, larger barns, and there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, Oh, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Why don't you relax, eat, drink, and be merry? He answers his own question with the idea that he comes up with on his own. Unfortunately, his answer is actually a pretty common reflection of people today. In Australia, in 2024, we think, oh, imagine that. I got all this finance. I can just sit back. I can relax. I can eat. I can drink. I can be merry. 
And many financial advisors might recommend such an answer. I hope there's no financial advisors in church today. It seems prudent and practical, doesn't it? And in the right situation, such as Joseph, who was in Egypt, if you remember, him storing up was wisdom because that fed his family for the seven years. That was God and that was wisdom. But something very important is missing in this story. What he did not do at this time of abundant blessing was to counsel with God, to consult God. He didn't do that. He thought, what am I going to do? I know I'm going to build these massive storage facilities and I'm going to store it all up and I'm going to be fine. You know, farming is one of the most obvious jobs that shows our utter dependence on the grace of God. Although we actually should be completely dependent upon him in every way, we are dependent on the weather. If you farm, you are dependent on the weather. You can't control the weather. This man completely ignored the blessing of God and completely ignored inquiring of the Lord what he wanted him to do with the blessing. What would be your response to a windfall blessing? You know, if somebody, if your parents pass away, and that's inevitable, and you receive an inheritance, what do you do with that? If you suddenly sell a piece of land, or you sell a building, or you sell something, is your first thought, whoa, look how much money is in the bank? Or is your first thought, God, what do you want me to do with this? And and I don't believe that God is calling you to give it all away. He might, and that's a conversation for you and God. But he might just say, hey, let's look at giving a bit to here, or let's look at giving a bit there, or let's sow into this. God has blessed you, not so that you can live comfortably with beautiful waterbeds and feather dunas and servants and everything else around you. Interestingly, I was telling Dion this week, we have some friends we went to school with, and I, I cannot fathom the life they live. These, they have an incredible business. Like we're talking, it's a huge business. He's a self-made man here in Australia. He's expanding to the United Arab Emirates. And it's huge, right? It's huge, this business. And they've got three beautiful kids. They live in a house on the Sunshine Coast that's just, you wouldn't live there. Like it's just, like, it's like a museum. I'm like, why would you live in this kind of a house? And they've got a cleaner. They've got a nanny. They've got a tutor, they have a cook that comes in, a gardener. They don't see their kids. What is the point, this is my perspective, what is the point of having all that money and not seeing the biggest gift God will ever give you, which is your kids? They travel the world six weeks of the year together and that's it. They have an au pair that does everything else for the kids. And I just looked at them and I thought, Man, like, I wouldn't mind another zero in the bank account, you know what I mean? But they've got zeros in the bank account. And I just think, I wouldn't be happy with that. Maybe you would be, and that's fine. But what a different life it is. And possibly for me, the saddest thing was to watch them. I'm not saying they've lost their faith completely, but it doesn't appear to be at the front of their life now. What appears to be at the front of their life is the yachts and all the plastic surgery that she's had and all the different things. And I think, God... At what point did they go from loving Jesus to that? What went wrong? And I believe it was the desire for more and more and more and more. And that's not what I want to do. So what would your response be to a windfall blessing? Maybe you're given a bonus at work, an unexpected check in the mail. Who still gets mail these days, right? Wouldn't that be nice? A gift from someone? Do you selfishly respond with, yes, look how much money I've got? Or do you say, thank you, Jesus. This is amazing. I made it a real habit in my business when our sale notification came through on my phone, you hear an audible sound to say, thank you, Jesus. And I love it when my kids say it. They hear it and they go, oh, thank you, Jesus. I think sometimes I don't think they know what they're saying. But they will learn that that means to be grateful and thankful and thank you, Jesus. That's amazing. This man decided in his heart that he would live life to the full because of his windfall. He was going to build bigger. He was getting his retirement ready. He was going to build the best place down there on the Gold Coast, if that's what it was. He was looking at all the things that he could do to make himself feel wonderful. Yet he missed something along the way. His biggest concern was number one. He wanted to make sure that he was taken care of. 
I'm not saying there's anything wrong with looking at your superannuation, with looking at how you're going to retire. That is actually wisdom. That's wisdom, to look through those things and plan for those things. What's not good is when your heart is entirely directed only toward yourself. To be so self-sufficient, you don't need God. Because the best thing, the learning, is when it's all stripped away, you realize you need God. You know, there was a poem written by William Ernest Henley. It was called Invictus. And he writes in this, He is the master of his own fate and the captain of his own soul. That's what this guy was. Let's listen to Jesus finish the parable. Verse 20, God said to them, Fool! (laughs) I don't want Jesus to call me a fool. Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, who will they be? So this is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards his God. Whoa, that's pretty sobering, right? Look back in verse 5 of this chapter, the frightening verse, which Jesus told us not to fear man, but to fear God, because who, after taking care of our life, can actually cast us into hell? Not man. God is the one who decides when he, when we arrive at those pearly gates and he plays, you know, you, you probably thought about this in your mind as well, or I have, the story of your life, all your conversations, your thoughts, your deeds, everything is laid out in front of you. He is the one that decides, not your mates, not the people that you hang around with, not the ones who think you are cool. This is why we have a fear of God. It doesn't mean to be afraid of God. It means, God, I fear you, Lord. I'm just, help me, Jesus. I need wisdom. We need wisdom in our finances. We need wisdom in how we approach our belongings. The rich young ruler's efforts were all about him and his efforts were all for nothing. Surely his riches would go to someone else and as the Bible says, the wages he had earned for himself, well, the wages of sin is death in Romans. And we don't want that. That's sobering stuff. Completing this parable, Jesus teaches us this is what happens to those who are not rich towards God and who instead store up treasures for themselves. Moving on to our third point this morning. So we know that we can fight against anxiety, one, by being content with what we have, two, by being concerned about the Lord's business. The second th- or third thing, beg your pardon, is we must fight anxiety through contemplation. How do you fight anxiety through contemplation? The word contemplation means thoughtful observation or careful study. Jesus is going to give the disciples some very simple and yet thought-provoking things to consider as he addresses their anxiety. Yeah, the disciples actually experienced anxiety. Anxiety is not new. Anxiety is not new and worries. We pick this up in Luke 12, 22. It says, Jesus said to his disciples, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. Don't be anxious about what you will eat, nor about your body or what you will put on. For life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. Jesus starts off by telling his disciples to be anxious for nothing. And I'm sure they're thinking, okay, well, you're the son of God, easy for you to say. Be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about your life, he says, your food, your body, your clothes. Note, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't work or you shouldn't take care of your body or you shouldn't take care of your possessions. All of those things are a bit of a given when we talk about this. But what we are to do is not be anxious about those things. To actually pray and bring these things to Jesus. His overarching reason for not worrying is that life is more than the things of earth. Worrying about the things of earth often leads to greed and selfishness and anxiety. So how do we fight against the cycle of greed and worry? Well, it's also in the Bible. Aren't you glad you came to church today to know that all of our problems are actually addressed in the Bible? Luke 12, 24 says, well, consider the ravens. That's a bird, in case you were wondering. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They don't have storehouses and they don't have barns. And yet God feeds them. 
of how much more value are you than a bird? That's what the scripture says to us. Ravens are an interesting choice for Jesus to mention here. God actually used them to feed Elijah in the wilderness back in 1 Kings, yet these birds were actually unclean, unclean birds. And they're the example. They're not really good for anything for the Jews. They were unclean. Unlike sparrows that were mentioned in Luke 12 that were used for food, ravens were unclean, (coughs) excuse me, and not able to be eaten. Yet God provided food for these birds. How much more does he care about you, his creation? Jesus ends the example with showing that mankind is of much greater value than the birds that he is talking about here. And this is important teaching for us today. Evolutionary theory has demeaned mankind. The lies of evolution teach that we are just a product of our environment. The Big Bang, a beautiful accident. Somebody just did something and something happened. Yet the Bible teaches that we are the crowning glory of creation. We're not an accident. We are the crowning glory glory of creation. Mankind has been given the charge and the authority to exercise dominion over the world. Listen to God speak of the creation of man in Genesis 1. He says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, and every living thing that moves on the earth. We are made in the image of God. We're not like the birds of the air or the fish of the sea. We are not like the animals that move on the earth. We are uniquely made in the image of God. In light of this great truth, Jesus then gives rhetorical questions in response to God's provision. And maybe you could answer these this morning. Luke 12, 25 says, And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to your life? That's what he says. You can't add anything to your life. If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, then why are you anxious about these things? I love the Bible. Isn't it good? In essence, Jesus says to his Jesus is asking the following questions. Jesus questions his disciples and asks them, can your worry add anything to your life? Can it make you taller? Can it make anything about your life better? No. And Jesus knows this and he's trying to get them to understand what is truly important. Jesus then says, if you are able to do a small thing, to add moments to your lifespan or add to your height, if you're not able to do those things, why would you be anxious about that? We have to acknowledge the fact that we are not in control. We are not in control. For some of you, that will set you free to believe that. God is. And a firm belief and understanding of God's sovereignty will help us fight against anxiety. You know, ironically, study after study after study has shown that anxiety, people who are chronic sufferers of anxiety, actually have shortened lifespans. So what does that tell you? The Bible is true. It's the first thing. Who of you by worrying can add an hour to your life? And if studies are saying people with chronic anxiety are reducing their lifespan, something's happening here inside us when we are anxious. Trusting in God and his sovereignty is not only a good theology, it's actually good for your practical living, for your day-to-day, for your health. And this doesn't mean that we don't care for our bodies. It means that we don't go for a run or go to the gym or eat healthy. In fact, all of those things are really good for us. However, God knows everything. He has determined the day that you were born. He has determined the day that you will die. And we know that we can trust him. Why? Because he just told us he cares for the little black birds that are unclean. How much more does he care for you? Matthew 6, 34 says, May we not worry about tomorrow, for it has enough worries of its own. 
Jesus has illustrated through contemplation or thoughtful observation that his children should not be anxious because the Father, which is God, will provide. And finally, point four this morning, Jesus gives the final way to fight anxiety in this passage. And that is we must fight anxiety through concentration. That's verse 31, 34. We're concentrating on what? We're concentrating on what matters. That's how we fight anxiety. What matters? The kingdom of God. Not this, it's the kingdom of God. The verse that we're going to read in the moment is Luke 12, verse 31. It says this, Instead, seek his kingdom and all these things will be added to you. It's a parallel from a more familiar verse in the book of Matthew. Matthew 6, verse 33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. It doesn't mean you won't drive a nice car. It doesn't mean you won't healthy. It doesn't mean you won't go on holidays. It just means where's your focus? Are you focusing on God? To focus on him is, I believe, the best way to do it. It's what the scripture says. We've proven that true in our lives. If you focus on God, well, he takes care of the rest. We can trust our heavenly father. Jesus tells his disciples not to be anxious for anything. Our focus should not be on our needs, but instead the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If we focus on Jesus, he will provide for us. If we work for his glory, the scripture says we will be blessed. This doesn't mean that we won't struggle. Of course we will struggle. The Bible tells you, you will struggle. But it does mean that he will provide for your needs. And we can trust our heavenly father. We can trust him. Some of you need a reminder of that. We can trust him. Are you focused on Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God more than you are focused on yourself? It's a sobering reminder for all of us. Are you focused on what the world has to offer? Are you focused on what the world has to give you? Paul teaches us a good lesson in Colossians 3 verse 2. He says, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. We must be focused on what is eternal if we want to make an impact for Christ. Every decision we make and everything we do needs to be understood through the lens of God's kingdom. You know, one of the things I love about our church is when we have a board meeting, we actually pray. And we say, God, would you guide us? Would you lead us? You know, I've got ideas and Chris has ideas and we've all got ideas, but God, we're actually here to build your kingdom, not here to build our own kingdoms, not here to assert our own authority or our own ideas. It's understanding that what we do is through the lens of God's kingdom. I love this verse in Luke 12, fear not little flock, that's us I think, with a little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Fear not. It's like Jesus is encouraging us in a fatherly and loving tone, fear not, little flock. You can imagine him saying that, right? He's encouraging you not to have fear. He's telling you that it's God's good pleasure to give you good things. But where do you focus? And where is your heart? If it's it's God's good pleasure to offer up Jesus Christ to be crucified for our sins so that he might have eternity with us. Wow. Makes you realize who we are, doesn't it? His good pleasure is in saving sinners like us. His good pleasure is showing up in his glory, in graciously offering his son Jesus on the cross. My prayer for us is that we would find good pleasure in him and serving him and seeking after kingdom things. He is worthy of our honor and he is worthy of our praise. And I wonder if the musos could come. Can we sing that song, Rach? I should have told you about it earlier. The one about under the wings. You know that one? It was the last one. Pictionary. It was like wings. We were under them. No, anyway, you'll work it out. But it really sums this up, I think, to, to think about who we are. 
Luke 12, 33 to 34 says, Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The scriptures don't condemn you if you don't sell everything you have. In fact, I don't believe it's telling all of us to sell everything and give it away. What the scripture teaches us is wisdom. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, as parents, we know the scripture says to us, your children are a gift from God. A gift from God. When Josh was born, I don't think I've ever understood that scripture more than that moment, that children are a gift from God. And sometimes as parents, we neglect to look at those gifts that God has given us and to be thankful for them. And our job as parents is to care for them, to raise them, to provide them, to love them. That's an incredible honor. Children are a gift. The scriptures don't condemn you if you don't sell everything. If you feel called to do that, go your hardest. But what Jesus does say is to consider the rich young ruler. We learned about him this morning in Matthew. Jesus is hitting our hearts here with this point. Should we be willing to give up everything for Christ? Our treasures must be in heaven, not on earth. Where your treasure is, your heart is. As we come to a close, you know, the cure for greed, that, well, that's the point of this one, to think about not being greedy. The cure for greed is generosity. If you're someone who struggles with holding on to things and just building and wanting more and more and more, the cure for that, biblical cure for that, is generosity. Okay, God, help me give. You know, parents, if you can teach your kids to tithe on the $2 of pocket money, they have as a child. When they are earning $200,000 as an adult, it will not be hard for them to tithe. But if they first learn to tithe off a greater figure, it may cause a little bit of angst and a little bit of pain. If you start with the small, those bigger numbers, it's easy. And this is why as parents, it's our job to teach kids, to raise our kids, to teach them the principles. I was thinking this morning actually, how much I love having the kids in here for praise and worship. I really love it. Yes, I make a bit of noise and I make a bit of mess. Who cares? The Bible says if the barn is clean, there's no one there. Do you want a clean church? Or do you want a church that's full of messy kids, noisy kids? That's the, that's the future of the church. That's actually the next generation. In fact, what that is, is these are the people who'll be running the church when we're old with our walkies coming into church. So how are we treating these little people? Are we loving them? Are we embracing them? You know, children do need boundaries, and I'm, I believe in that 100%. But what children need is love, the love that Jesus gives them. And I, I want my kids to, to get up and think, yes, it's church day, not, oh, the old people are going to be whinging again. It's true. It's true because... Kids have been turned off churches before by the attitudes of older people in them. And we have to look around. I remember Bruce Leader saying to me this once before, who cares if your kids make noise in church? What I care about, there are kids in church. And a real light went on in my mind. I thought, man, Bruce, you get it. Kids are amazing. The cure for greed is generosity. The cure for idolatry is to destroy the idol and replace it with Christ. As we have stated this morning, we've learnt this morning, the problem with greed is not a money problem. You could have no money in the bank or you could have millions in the bank and still be facing the same problem. The heart issue, it's a worship problem. What do you worship? Do you worship money? Do you worship looking good? Do you worship possessions? Do you worship worldly things? Or do you worship Jesus? I don't think it matters how much money you have in the bank. I was saying to Dion the other day, we we're talking about some people that we know and, and people who really, when they first start out on their tithing journey or their giving, they can only give $5. 
But the passion, the conviction behind that $5, there's a, there's a Bible story about this one as well. I mean, you remember, we've read this one before. As you can see for that person, they are literally giving their all to Jesus. And, and God's hand is not short that he goes, oh, it's only five bucks. That's not going to go far this week, is it? Like we serve a miraculous God. He's the one that works out the figures. He's the one that puts the extra zeros behind things. It's not about what you give. It's about your heart when you give. Sometimes as humans, we think, oh, geez, the bank account's a bit of a problem. And I know Chris Wood can attest to this. Sometimes we've had board meetings and we think, geez, Lord, you're going to have to show up. And he does. You know, during COVID, when everyone else was going like this, when things were going down, how do you think our church finances went? Like this. It was mind-blowing. It was miraculous. It was nothing that we did. We, we didn't send out a, by the way, church, we could do with a few extra bucks this week. It wasn't that. It was God saying, hey, you know what? I saw this. I knew that would happen. I've set this up and here we go. And I just look at that and think, okay, we can trust you. Never let us down before. Why would you start now? It's a heart issue. How's your heart going? You know, as we come to a close this morning, we've heard some pretty tough words from Jesus today. Don't be anxious for anything, he says. I think we've been encouraged to fight anxiety through being content, being concerned with the things of the kingdom, being concerned with the things of the heart, being concerned with what's on God's heart, Contemplating, giving careful observation to God's providence and concentrating on what really matters, which is the kingdom of God. Church, there are so many things that you and I can worry about. So many. We, we could sit down and we could write a list of all the worries. We really could. Finances, health, possessions, retirement, the state of our nation. God knows we need a miracle. World affairs. I mean, you watch the news last weekend. The list is endless, but there is a cure for all of this. And that is to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of those other things will be added to us. When we daily seek Christ above all, we can rest well knowing that he is sovereign and he is over everything. We can trust him to provide what we need. We can trust him. If, if you don't know of any good testimonies and miracles about this, just ask people after church and people will share with you things that have happened in their life. We can rest well knowing that our eternity is secure if we are in Christ. You know, church, my prayer for you this morning is that you would trust Christ fully in everything, that you would consult Him first, that you would ask Him Lord, how do I approach this? What do you want me to do with this? How do we get through this, God? Seek first the kingdom of God. You know, he is worthy and he is faithful and you can trust him. And so this morning, we're gonna sing this song again. And I just wonder, you know, maybe if from a heart of honesty, if you would say, you know what? I'm not really nailing this area in my life not really trusting God fully. I know I need help in that. Maybe you do have some very real issues that you are facing, worries and concerns that are in your life. We're going to stand to our feet and we're going to worship. Worship is powerful. We learned that in June, remember? But you know what else is powerful? Prayer. Prayer is powerful. Prayer will move mountains. And so this morning, we're going to pray with you. I think Pastor Kevin's here, Pastor Kevin's here, Chris, different ones. We're going to pray with you this morning to see a real breakthrough in your situation. But at the end of the day, I hope what you take away from today is that you can fight anxiety if you focus on the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. Will life bring you troubles? Yep, it will. But seek first the kingdom of God. Come on, let's stand to our feet. We're going to sing this song this morning. If you would like prayer, I would love to pray with you. But let's just spend some moments seeking His face, hey? Really pouring our hearts out in worship.